Hey gang, it's Dr. Gonzo, and this is Ask Dr. Gonzo Anything, and we're uh, you're listening to Talking Points. Um, hope you guys are doing good during this crazy time in the history of, of the world. Um, we all know the COVID-19 has just basically upended us from a personal uh, point of view, from a financial point of view, from a you know, society point of view, and it's actually a, a, it's a really interesting time in the history of what we're doing right now. Um, I honestly, other than hurricanes and, uh, and probably the, cra the crash of the, of the market in 2017, I've never really lived through something like this. But uh, I think that right now we're all kind of trying to understand what the impact is today and how the impact is going to impact us in the future. But certainly it's, it's a really crazy time in our, in our history. Um, a couple of years ago, I, uh, I I talked to a good friend of mine who's a huge supporter of uh, of me and and the work that we do at Fort Worth, um, uh, Stuart Flynn, who happens to be the dean the dean of the uh, TCU UNT uh, Medical School, which opened its doors to the first class in uh, this past uh, fall. So, Stuart, thanks for being with us again. Thanks for the invite. So, you know, as I, as we started the show, I wanted, you know, I was talking to the audience and to the listeners talking about, uh, you know, how this whole COVID thing has really changed the way that we do things and has affected us at least in the last four weeks in such an amazing way, incredible way. Um, t you know, how, how are you doing? I mean, how, how are you and the family holding on uh, right now? Yeah, great question. I think we have some similarities. We both have uh, children. Um, so I have uh, a couple of children still in K through 12. So they're being now homeschooled through their school, which is going surprisingly well, but it's, it's a change without question. Um, I have a, a son who's in college who now also is home and also is doing the same thing and being educated from afar. Um, so I think to echo the beginning of, of, of uh, your conversation, this is uh, this is definitely scary. It's scary at a very personal level. I um, I get concerned every time somebody from my family <clears throat> goes out for an essential. Most notably, my wife if she goes grocery shopping. Um, that's the first time in our lives I think we've had to be that micro focused on a day and a part of a day. Um, bad things have always happened, but but here it can happen that quickly and manifest within a matter of days. So, um, but I'm in the same boat as everybody else. Uh, and then professionally, we can talk about that later. That also has been altered. But Gonzo, I would fully imagine you're in a very similar situation. Yeah, and, and you hit it on the head about what's going on, at least, you know, from the our household. Um, you know, it's funny because you don't think about those, you didn't think about those things in the past. You know, there's, there's, there's a personal aspect of the household, right? So every time we hear somebody is stricken or dies uh, because of the coronavirus, um, you know, you hear the age and everybody's eyes are like popping up and, and, and we're like, oh my God, he was only 50, you know, or right. somebody in their forties, you know, you see it starts affecting the age group that we're in right now. You're like, oh, you know, and that's aside from the fact that it's so scary. Um, you know, I think about my father, and I was I was telling you um, before we started the show that my father turned ninety two. Okay, so uh, we we now that we have video conferencing and everybody's kind of much more in tune as to doing this uh, uh, with video conferencing, we had decided to get all the brothers together. There's five brothers. And we got everybody together and, and uh, we went on, on FaceTime and FaceTime dad. And, uh, and we all wished him happy birthday. I mean, listen, it was really emotional, but, but it, 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 you know, despite the fact that it was a really beautiful moment that we had all of us together for the first time in I don't know how many years. Right. Um, what, what it did remind us is that, you know, like dad is 92 and he's at the highest risk, right? right. His age. And, uh, and, and you talk about scary. I mean, I don't know about you, if you have your parents or uh, mm -hmm. uncles or somebody who's close to you yeah. that's alive. You know, mom the other day, I think during the first week or maybe the second week of this whole COVID thing uh, breaking out, she said, well, you know what? We, you know, I had to drive your dad to the bank. And I'm like, what? Right. 
to the bank? And she's like, yeah, you know, he had to pay some bills. And I'm like, I said, mom, I'm, I'm, I really, do you, uh, but like my parents who really have been, have lived accustomed to doing the things like they do, like leaving home and going to the bank. They, there's a lot of people out there that just like mom and dad who really are not comfortable doing it over the internet and not having to leave the house. And they're risking going out to doing things like going to the bank or the grocery stores or things like that, because that's how they've done things all their lives. Exactly. Exactly. I, I think the other thing, I, I agree with you. Um, the other thing that, that, you know, I do think we reflect on the underserved and the homeless and the um, meals on wheels and the, and the nursing care, but this is a whole new adversity for them also. And, um, and most of us have not walked in their shoes, so we can only kind of imagine how difficult this is for them. But, but in addition to that, because of their proximity and because of their inability to isolate themselves, um, they also represent a unique risk population in the sense of social distancing in those environments may be impossible, quite frankly. Um, yeah. So that, that's another thing that, that all of a sudden we are all one now as a society and not to be Pollyannish or whatever about it, but this is non-discriminatory. We're, we're, we're all at risk for this one. And, and you know, I'll tell you that growing Growing up and when I was in medical school, it was this whole deal with HIV, right? I mean, you and I remember the HIV uh, pandemic. Um, some of us also, well, a lot of us uh, also dealt with the Ebola, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, HIV was such a dramatic thing, right? Because all of a sudden, it, it was something that not only affected a particular population, but it could, it could be transmitted to other people in the population. And, and, you know, I remember, you know, I, I guess the, the biggest story that everybody remembers during the HIV crisis was a like Magic Johnson, right? Right. When, when the disease stopped affecting the core group of, of homosexuality, which is what everybody felt, you know, that what they were, we were secluded. But then when, when somebody like Magic Johnson got the infection, then everybody's like, oh my God, it, 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 it transmits between, you know, lifestyles too. And, uh, and that was really eye-opening and scary because at that time, you know, I mean, we didn't really understand it. We were starting to understand how it propagated and how it contracted. In fact, you remember, um, this, I, it's really ingrained in my, in my memory because um, it was a classic show. It was C. Everett Hoop. Remember him? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've met him, actually. And, and he had a show on HBO in which he um, uh, eliminated all, a lot of the hysteria. He did a really nice job. He was this guy with a, if you guys, if you guys don't, that are listening or watching don't know who this guy was, he used to be the uh, uh, oh, Surgeon General. The Surgeon General for the United States, and he was an, uh, uh, a Navy guy. Yep shows he had a show on hbo and he had uh he was dressed up in his in his uh, you know his uniform right he had this white beard that wrapped he didn't he didn't have a mustache he had a white beard that just basically went around the chin and then these spectacles yeah. and you know there and but he was a factual guy remember he he was like oh, you sure. know, he was just very pragmatic he didn't really sugarcoat things he said i remember him saying you know, you can't get HIV if somebody spits on, on the and you lick. I mean, that's not how you get it. it, it I mean, he had some really, he really did actually uh, alleviate some of the anxiety, but. No, I agree. Stuart? Stuart? So I was like, something contagious, but we didn't know what it was. Um, and I remember the hysteria through both society and through the healthcare community. So a lot of similarities to this. What? What became apparent reasonably quickly, to your point, was it wasn't as transmissible as the initial fears were. Um, that's not the case for COVID. This is, you know, wicked transmissible. Well, and and I look, go ahead. 
talked about it before the show, but you know, I have to admit that I was on the bandwagon initially of the group of people that were saying, "What's? Why is everybody freaking out about it?" Right, and that was that was early March when we started hearing of what was happening in Italy and all that stuff. And I really wrong. I mean, I I wasn't really correct on it. I was truly wrong, uh, and I regret thinking that way but you know i justified it in my mind well you know socialist medicine versus you know capitalist medicine all these things we got more resources they right. were much more selective and so i justified it in my mind maybe just to alleviate some of the anxiety but what what makes you know what makes this virus different from from uh you know the other viruses that we've actually seen well i think um from my point of view a couple things so one of the most contagious viruses we've always talked about um, was, uh, was um, 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 uh, chicken pox, which is fascinating, right? Because we now have a vaccine for it. But chicken pox, if you looked at a kid and you were a kid, and I'm being facetious, you got chicken pox. But the ramifications for 99.9% .9 of the kids who got it, you know, other than maybe a scar on your face from one of the pox that really, you know, went deep and maybe got infected, so that's the first thing. So we have some very infectious viruses, but it's the, it's the ramification that I think is so profound with this one. Um, All right. So its transmissibility is about as transmissible as anything we've ever seen um, relative to other viruses. You know, you've brought up HIV, that, that has very specific transmissible uh, factors. This is a droplet kind of um, uh, contagion. It's also a fomite. It, it attaches, it goes from a sneeze to a milk carton that you then pick up and now it's on your hands, you rub your eye and now you're infected. Um, so I think that I think that's one big thing is, is it is just there. I think a second thing and we're still, we're lifetime figuring this out, Right. is the number, the transmissibility of this from one person, the R not kind of factor that now we think um, some early data, they're probably 10 to 50 times the number of people who show symptoms are actually infected. We know that there's a few day at least period where you feel great and you're 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 transmissible. You're infected, and you're giving you you have the virus, and you can give it to others. Um, and then and then I think the sheer um, power of this virus, with what it does primarily to one's lungs. And then the last thing, you know, these are intriguing to us. We're in medicine, we're physicians, but it's not intriguing to the person who who has this. Is the other thing is is this can start out kind of slow. So you just feel kind of crummy, you feel viral-ish for two, three days, and then all of a sudden, maybe unlike influenza, in a given person, it just spikes. And the next thing, you're on a ventilator because you can't breathe. So I think those factors of things just make this so much more, and, and we have no um, immunity to this either. That's the other thing, the entire world are, are all brand, we've never seen a virus like this before that we have any immunity to it. I think this is just unfortunately the perfect storm and that's how we end up with a, with a pandemic, which by definition is global. Well, and, and, and I, one of the things that I'm not, I, I'm still not sure, and again, I'm actually learning about this like everybody else, okay? But, um, you know, Julian and I, my, my son, my oldest boy, Julian had a, a, an assignment and uh, he, for school and he was actually, having to pick out some topics on and it's a biology uh, uh, class. And he was having to pick up topics with some social impact or social nice. disruption kind of deal. And he had the topics that were related to, you know, um, euthanasia and uh, 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 globalization or legalization of marijuana, uh, using uh, machines to help people. And then non-human organs for transplantation which is xenotransplantation right so you know we started i, st I said listen right now the, the best thing you can do is write about xenotransplantation because it's it's a transmission this, this is what happened with the covid i mean it got transmitted from an animal to a human being which rarely happens and what i've read about it is that this is the first time that that a virus 
has been able to sort of change its shape, morph its shape so that it can infect the human. Now, that, that's, that's just natural selection, right? Right, right. It's, it's, it's not thinking of doing it. It's just basically you select out the particular strain, the, those basically strains survive better than the ones that can't cross into humans, and that's how it gets propagated right. into the human body. But what's interesting about this, which is, to your point, the scary part about it is that these are the, the those viruses those that can basically get into your DNA. Right. And, and that's the scary thing about it, whereas other viruses will attach to the cell walls and the outside, which make them vulnerable to, the, to our immune system, right? These viruses, what makes them unique is their ability to insert themselves inside through the cell wall and then attach inside of your DNA and then replicate themselves using your own DNA machinery, right? That's, that's what makes it scary. And then once it kills the cell, it parasite, it's a parasitic virus, then it throws out a bunch of other copies that does the same thing to the other cells. Now, in hopes of trying to alleviate it while we do have immunity, it's the same, our own immunology is the one that's actually causing the damage because they produce these cytokines, we produce all these byproducts that cause inflammation, right? Uh, yeah, I think, um, so I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So if you want to use a paradigm that doesn't um, necessarily, it does not have this fulminant of a course in the vast majority of patients, would be, for instance, uh, hepatitis virus, hepatitis B, for instance. It does the same thing. What it doesn't do, it kills the hepatocyte that it's infected. It doesn't result in this intense cytokine storm. Yeah. Um, and so it may, it may cause liver failure, cirrhosis, and it may ultimately kill you, but that may be years and years later. And that's not, that's not a given outcome either. You can heal and be fine. So th that's the part of this. It does everything you said, but in addition, it, it, our immune system just goes crazy on this. And so we're now the vehicle of our immune system trying to do what it does. But, but all of these uh, chemical reagents, these cytokines, are, are powerful. And so one of the big things that ends up happening is we end up, as you know well, this is your world, we end up with leakage in the lungs, and we, and we end up with inflammatory cells in the lungs. And what are the lungs built to do to have a very thin membrane so we can breathe and have oxygen go from the air into our bloodstream? Well, you start throwing those factors into your lungs, and it goes, it thickens up. Exactly. And so now you wonder why people are on ventilators. We're trying to force the oxygen through that process into their bloodstream. So um, liver, very important, as we know. But lungs, if I can't breathe, mm -hmm. I literally can't live. Well, and, you, and, I don't, and I'm still not understanding the immunology of it because, um, you know, people, there are people that actually are carriers and remain asymptomatic. We have multiple examples of that right now happening, right? That people test positive and then they, they, they never get symptoms. So there is, there is some resistance, right? I, and I've been interested in hearing how people are using their plasma, right? In hopes of, of providing some type of immuno, immunology. Right. And, but but I'm not going to dive into the immunology because <laughs> it's a little too complicated. But the reality about it is that that's not any more different than IVIG, right? Because that's what you do. I mean, right, right, we're, right. We're giving people is IVIG, and and you and I know from all the work that we've done with immunology and transplants and stuff, IVIG has been always this black box. Yeah. Nobody knows how it works. No, but we love the fact that it, we have that black box when we need it. Yeah, and so and so we're just replicating that. I'm not making light of it. I'm just yeah. finding it curious that we're going back to a therapy that for years we've used with inflammatory immunological, and Completely. people say they get better, and there is some truth to that. And I don't want to say that it doesn't work. Right. I'm saying that we really don't understand how it works because for some things, IG in certain concentrations can be immunosuppressant. For in other concentrations, it could be actually immunoprotective. Yes. How does it work? I think we're still trying to figure it out. I agree. I agree. And I think the last comment on immunology is, uh, like any virus, um, society has a spectrum 
of, of how individuals respond. I think what's proving different for this is just the, the skew of that curve to a greater subset that have this very intense immunologic cytokine response. Right. Um, and, and that's when it goes from being functional, because those are functional responses immunologically to an infectious organism, to now they become pathologic because you overshot the runway and, and now they're doing damage rather than, 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 than killing the virus. So I just think it's skewed. I think we see this response, this spectrum in any viral infection. This one just has a different, um, uh, uh, maybe exponential intensity at the end where people become uh, pathologic, where it becomes a pathologic outcome. So it's interesting for the listeners and the viewers. Um, one of the fun things that I that I that I enjoy about working with Stuart is that Stuart is a pathologist, right? And so mm -hmm. I'm the surgeon. It's like that that joke that says, you know, the, the surgeon kills an ant, a bird, and says, "See if they're ducks." You talk to the pathologist, but but I I I enjoy the same passion at the micro vascular yeah. level I did work uh, when I was at Duke on immunobiology and so when I talked to Stuart we talk at a very microscopic level the cool thing that Stuart also brings to the table of pathologists is his ability to sort of look at a microscopic level and then interpret the pathology by looking right at what's happening at the cellular level and then putting it together in terms of a pathological and pathophysiology so any students uh, that are watching and listening to us just keep in mind that Stuart is not only the dean; he's one damn good pathologist. <laughs> uh, you're you're very nice, Gonzo. <laughs> but uh, okay, so now talking about students, okay, um, you know it's it, it's always cool to look back and see of the work that you've done, and see how things have evolved. You know, moving forward, I I told my son yesterday when we were doing that project on xenotransplantation, I said we're dumber today than we will be in you know, tomorrow, right? And so, you know, you and I had a, an interview uh, about a year or two ago, I think two years ago, before the medical school started, okay? And you had some really cool visions and impressions and hopes, okay? But now, here we are today, 2020, the first class is already enrolled. You probably were able to achieve what you hoped for with some, like everything else, you know, you've got you're, you're, you got to figure out the, the kinks and processes and stuff like that. But then all of a sudden, you know, the, your, your six months, first six months of the medical school are going around. And then all of a sudden, COVID-19 hits. Right. So it upends not only society, right? But it upends also the way that we're going to our future doctors. So right. see what's going on at, at TCU, UNT now with this whole virus thing and how the students getting prepared and studying for, for all of this. Yeah, so um, I think the good news for the start for our school is we only have one class. If we had four classes, then we'd be scrambling because one thing medical students nationwide are not allowed to do right now is to see patients. And obviously to become a doctor, one would expect and one would demand that you have to see patients. So the good news for us is we're not there yet, unlike every other school that's fully established. Um, we haven't had to change much in the way of our vision of what we're, how, how we're, the, the paradigm of how we want to train these individuals. So what has changed? So I will start with a very genuine compliment to our students who, no surprise, have been mature, have been accepting of, of the environment. They know it's not our doing. They know it's not their doing. Um, the faculty have stepped up and have, have um, very selflessly um, realized it's not about them, it's about our students. So everything we do is to try to optimize our students' education. But like you and I are doing right now, everything now is by Zoom and it's one on 60. So in a, a week from tomorrow, I will lead a panel of three of our physicians in Fort Worth. Yeah with our 60 students to have our students see what these three individuals in different disciplines how this is impacting we are going to take advantage of a pandemic which i hope these young people never live through again in their lives 
but it is happening right now. So we're going to advantage that and they're gonna learn things about public health and about vaccines and about how this impacts the healthcare systems. What can't we do right now, which is part of what you're probably referring to? Well, our students cannot physically be with a patient. So that's, that's hard, that, that, as you know, we both did this. This was our elixir, this is what excited us. This is why we went to medical school to see patients diagnose and help and cure. Um, so we're doing everything short of that. So we have um, anatomy. We have some phenomenal tools to teach anatomy. Um, is if, 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 if we had had all the augmented, all the hollow lenses, we would have shipped these out to our students and they could have done augmented reality um, in their homes, wherever they reside or around the country. We're even doing standardized patients through the interviewing format. So you might be a standardized patient. I'm the student. I have my mentor is watching me do this, who would have watched me do it live time in an examining room, but now is doing it by Zoom. I can't touch you, but I can still fine tune whatever you have, which I don't know, you've been trained to know what you have, so we're, we're doing as much as we can do short of the true physical grouping elements of things, um, like everyone else. But I, I will say our school was designed in a way that this transition, I would have preferred we not do this, but since we don't have lectures, this has worked out well. All of our, all of our information is online already, and so we've adjusted. Um, but I, I'm impressed, I'm, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful for our students. I'm thankful for our faculty. Well, and it, and it's and it's interesting because today I was um, uh, I was in the car driving back from getting my cup of coffee uh, at Starbucks. Um, I think it's closed, but you can go through the drive through Okay. The uh, and I was listening to NPR on my way back home, and um, there was a there was a sh segment on Saturdays or a show on Saturdays that, that relates to physical therapy and orthopedics and sports medicine. Um, and there were these two doctors talking about the impact that coronavirus has had in practices, right? And so they were they were talking about telemedicine and how different the world is, right? Because um, you know they they now have to see patients through telemedicine, right? And and they have to have a disclosure that says, well, you know, you may have to come in for an exam, right. which, which is super interesting to me because when, when I was in medical school, um, I, I was taught that 80 to 85% of the diagnosis comes from the history alone. You hone in, you hone in on that. And from that, you get a differential diagnosis. Okay. So then once you have your differential diagnosis, then then you did some testing or physical exam right. and distill that to another percent of patients that have, you know, another two or three differential diagnosis. And then and then you would add the test and the test would only contribute about maybe about five percent of the confirmatory diagnosis of what you had. But that was in an era in which we could actually put our hands on people and do the physical exam. Right. I, I never understood why is it. In fact, you know what? I just noticed. You see this book right there. This book that I'm pointing out. What is it? Actually, you, I, I don't know if you can read it, but it says Moby's Guide to Physical Examination. <laughs> you dirty dog. That is awesome, right? That is awesome. Yeah, that's a throwback. That's a throwback right there, but that's my book. Yeah. Go right here, right here. That's my book when I was in medical school. Absolutely. That, that we used to do physical examination. And I really didn't understand until today. I have, well, I, maybe years before. But how important that lesson was of understanding is that you really have to hear the story. Right. And once you have the story together, then the physical exam and the, the test that you do are the ones that confirm the test, the, the diagnosis. But I, I really do think that we're going to start depending in this era less and less of the physical exam. Some specialties, okay, not all specialties. Right. 
So I do think that there are some specialties that are going to still utilize physical exam to their, you know, to try to make the diagnosis. But in this tech heavy world that we live in, don't you think that we're going to have more tests being done remotely? Like we talk about blood pressure. We no, no longer use a stethoscope to, right. to, you know, blood pressure. We no longer just put our fingers over the pulse, right? right. Um, we, we, we have pulse oxes. We got heart rate monitors. We got Fitbits. We got everything. Yep. Um, Eric Topol uh, at Scripps, um, and you know him. Uh -huh. Eric, Eric is talking about, you know, using our cell phones, right? Right. To echoes. So no yep. Or, I mean, he's talking about um, not using a stethoscope anymore, right? I mean, that's crazy for people that actually depend on it um, to listen to murmurs, to listen. Right. Imagine a world and can you just basically scan yourself, right? And you can you look at the lungs and have an x-ray right there. You can look at an ultrasound and look at your um, a heart, look at your carotids and not have to listen to bruits and all that stuff. I mean, what, what's your thought about that in medical training altogether? Well, I think, so first of all, I've heard the same percentage as you, 90% of what you glean from a patient is history and physical. And what that really means, if you, if you take a moment to, to contemplate, it's listen. It's listen to your patient, right? Don't talk, but listen to your patient's story. So that, that in 2020 is imperative. That is foundational to how we're training our students. That's the first thing. The negative, I would say, is I kind of scatter your question. And I've watched this, you know, running residency programs now for more decades than I care to admit. What, what every era wants to do is they want to go to the newest, coolest thing. So if you're a radiology, let's go right to the coolest imaging. Well, if you're a pathologist, let's throw antibodies on, light it up, fluorescence, whatever, and it's going to give me the answer. The reality is, if you don't have the foundation, if you don't know what it is with some inkling, what that differential is to your point, then, and I've watched this happen. So then you, in my world, you throw a bunch of antibodies to see what lights up. And when it lights up, that's my answer, right? What happens when nothing lights up? And I've watched this so many times. So in my world, what doesn't light up when you don't think of it is a lymphoma. Okay. So I think it's a carcinoma. I think it might be a sarcoma. I think it might be a germ cell tumor. I throw all those antibodies on it. They're all negative. Now, Gonzo, I could ask you as a cardiovascular surgeon, how does a pathologist, a pathology resident think when everything comes back negative? I'm not going to force you to answer that. I'm going to tell you what the answer is. The answer isn't <laughs> that. The answer isn't that I didn't ask the right question. The answer is this antibody didn't work. I thought this was a carcinoma. It didn't light up. It's a carcinoma. What it was was a lymphoma. So you have that to a pathologist. That's our history and physical. Yeah. Don't go immediately to the fancy test. But to your point, we are going to go there. We already are. You can take any, I can send you my EKG. You can, you can uh, send me what a heart biopsy looks like on a transplant, right? We don't, we don't need to be next to each other to do those things. Um, to your point, smartphone, echoes, we're already using. I, I think the fear among physicians or young people thinking of going into medicine is this is all going to put us out of a job, right? We're not going to need radiologists because AI is going to interpret. They do a better job interpreting mammograms than the human eye does. Um, but if you think about what we're talking about, a critical part of our job is actually the humanism behind what the, you know, so I send you my EKG and I have a fib. Okay, I have a fib. I still need you as a person yep. to not talk to me about that. And I'm not minimizing that our hands aren't going to continue to be important. We still have a critical role to play in all of this. And our students are going to be the leaders of this transition. And I hold them accountable to that. And I say that to them. And that should be somewhat daunting to them. But in a long-winded way, I would tell you, telemedicine, it, I think because of this pandemic now, we've had no choice. We've resisted it to this point. Now it is going to become foundational to how we see our patients 
but it doesn't mean we disappear and it doesn't mean we never see them and we never lay hands on them. Well, I'll tell you one thing and you, and you highlighted a couple of things that, that are critical to, to uh, underscore. Uh, the first thing is that, you know, I, the importance of, of having a good history, okay, without having the ability to examine a person, okay, yeah. the pathologists are probably the best at it, right? Because oftentimes you depend on the history, okay, yeah. to some level, the, the physical exam, certainly the radiological exam that's coupled to it, right? Yep. Yeah. And then make an interpretation based on something that you read without even having to speak to the patient. Okay. Now I'm not, I'm not advocating that everybody does that, but I am just framing the whole argument of saying physical therapy may not be totally as much in terms of our diagnosis as important as these other things that we're doing. However, we're going to have to figure out the cost of it. I agree with you. I think that a patient will always want to talk to their doctors, whether it's this way, whether it's face to face, okay? Whether they care to be examined or not, I am not so sure how society is going to respond. And honestly, while we care to, to like that or not, telemedicine is here to stay. I mean, right. there is no way that we're going to be not doing this in the future now that we all understand the risks associated to the frontline people, right? Which is, you know, which are the ones that we worry also the most about. Um, an interesting story that I wanted to, that you remind me of, and you were talking about how a pathologist, when they, when they see something and they can't stain it, or, you know, you blame the stain, all that stuff, and you hang your diagnosis on two things, lymphoma or carcinoma. I'll tell you a story, but it's very relevant to today's day. It was uh, um, uh, about two years ago. Um, uh, and, and, and just to put perspective of the, of, to the listeners and to the viewers, um, as a heart surgeon, I'm part of the team uh, of, of practitioners that put people on artificial lungs. Right. Breathing machines uh, don't work. So if you're on a breathing machine intubated on a ventilator and you can't support them with that, okay, you've already exhausted that and you're supporting as best as you can, there's one more level of care that can be given to the patient and putting them on, our, on, on artificial lungs and artificial lung. And that machine uh, is termed ECMO. It's called extracorporeal, outside of the body, um, uh, oxygenator membrane. And it, it's, a, it's a portable heart lung machine, which was um, initially created by a guy by the name of John Gibson. Uh, and it's what led to the creation of the heart lung machine later on that big hunking thing that looked like a shopping cart that becomes, became smaller to allow us to transport patients that are critically ill from one location to the other and support them in the intensive care unit. And the machine has gone from a shopping cart to this little thing that looked right. like a suitcase. And I, and we're part of the team that's responsible for putting the people on ECMO to support their oxygenation while the hung, lungs he, heal. Well, the reason I'm going through all this story is that there's only a few centers in the United States that do this. Fortunately enough, in Fort Worth, Baylor, and all things, and that's a shout out to the team over in Baylor, uh, are, are, the only, are the only team, and I mean that multidisciplinary team, that does this in the city of Fort Worth. Two years ago, we had um, two or three patients that showed up to the intensive care unit with their lungs that were completely, uh, uh, I mean, they had ARDS, so they're, they were completely injured by whatever it was causing it. And because it was that time of year in the fall, we did what we regularly do, right? We go ahead and we tested them for the flu. And what happened was um, the flu test came back negative, right? So this is, this is only two years ago. So you can put in perspective how we also are only smarter today than we were yesterday okay so what happens well it's not the flu so everybody they don't put the right. mask on they don't have to wear ppes right everybody's right we've never had to nothing's happened nobody's gotten sick from the flu to a point of and it's rare that somebody develops to your point um uh the flu or gets the flu but 
and I got I got in trouble because um, I was worried. I I didn't understand pathologically or pathophysiologically what was killing these guys, right? For right. two. Well, um, I I said okay, I don't want anybody, and I got in trouble because they they were upset with my position taking care of my own staff. And, uh, and they found it excessive. Hmm. Well, I wonder now, okay, looking back, they were flu negative. They didn't have bacteria in their, in their sputum, right. okay? But they were, it, it was their lungs were completely uh, injured. I wonder whether it could have been coronavirus back then. Or, or a novel virus that for some reason never set up shop, right? Correct. Uh, so, and so what I'm going with the story is you point out, you know, sir, maybe the stains are right. Maybe you're measuring the wrong thing. Right. Right. And, and I think that, that as, as doctors, you have to have the insight, right. To look at it and say, wait a minute, this person was okay, healthy. All of a sudden we got the situation today. We may not have the test to measure that for the next pandemic, just like it happened with, eventually HIV, just like it happened eventually with the Ebola, right? We yeah. saw these people dying, we couldn't figure it out. And then we started sort of searching and searching and searching. The same thing happened with COVID. I'm sure that when it broke out, nobody knew what was going on and we were adjudicating to the flu. But only right. when we figured out that it was flu negative, right. that we then said, well, let me test for another thing. And Lord and behold, we ran into, this wasn't, this wasn't something that occurred purposefully. This this happened because our differential diagnosis continued to bother us to the point of finding a test that ultimately proved that we were right. It was COVID, correct? Right. Yeah, I think, I think just to echo a couple of things you've said, and you know, somewhat philosophical. Um, first of all, I do think the physical exam, and it already has, we've refined it, and it'll get now more refined based on technology and, and telemedicine and the like. That should not be an excuse for anybody because, and it's, and it's, it's a natural, when you're overwhelmed and there's so much to do, you'd love to have things that you no longer have to do, right? It just buys you more time, less, less brain storage you have to deal with. I, I think it's imperative to learn the physical exam for the time you're in training and don't anticipate that five years from now, you're not going to need it because of ultrasound or some newfangled technology. Right. The other thing, which is also philosophical, and I think, you know, physicians, Gonzo, we're living proof of this, right? We're, we're data-driven, we're type A, and we'd like to be right. Let's call a spade a spade, right? So when you had those three patients and all of your tests came back negative, that's not a reason to drop your guard. That just means what we do know it isn't. But the real problem is, what don't we know? And I think COVID has kind of lived up to that. Um, and we'll see another one of these. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the offshoots of HIV, which you may or may not know because you live in a sterile environment because you're in the OR all the time, is universal precautions. Because prior to HIV, you, you know, I, I would see people in a variety of disciplines, including mine, pick up an organ with no gloves on. And, and thought nothing about it, right? And maybe our biggest fear was, was one of the viral hepatitides, and we didn't even know what hep C was at that point. We were still trying to discover it. Right. All of a sudden, because of HIV, now it became mandated. You were out of compliance if you didn't have eyewear and gloves on to pick up a specimen in pathology, for instance. We'll see what the ramifications of this are downstream, but there will unquestionably be changes immediate, but 10 years from now, when people look back, we're looking back on HIV, that's 30 years ago. Yeah. What, what were the ramifications of what we learned from that over the evolution of 10, 20, and 30 years? Yeah. Um, don't throw the physical out. When you don't know something, don't assume it isn't something bad, you just don't know what it is. So you're seeing patients with immense lung failure Something is doing that. You just couldn't figure out what it was. Well, and, and to your point, I think that the good thing about all these, if they're, well, I should say, shouldn't say good thing. The, there, there are things that we call disruptive. 
and disruptive can be used in a positive way as well as a negative way. Now, yes. I try to look at things glass half full. And so what are the good things that are coming out of, and, and it's kind of oxymoron maybe for some to say there's something good. But I do think that there's a lot of really good things that are coming out of this. I mean, I, I think that the fact that people are being much more careful about their own hygiene and making sure that their hands are clean, that they're handling things appropriately, um, those are really good things that they're washing their hands. Um, you know, when they come in and out of the car, that they're keeping distance when they know they're not feeling well, that heightened uh, sense of awareness is probably one of the best things that has come out of it. And I applaud it because it doesn't only interfere with the ability of transmitting a disease like COVID-19. It does diminish the, the risk and exposure of other diseases that will come and we already know of. I mean, take for instance, I, I, we, we've been so focused on COVID-19 over the last month that nobody's talked about what has this behavior done and impacted the flu, right? right. Because, because everybody is now hot on it, you know, and I'm not saying that it's wrong, but there are other diseases, seasonal uh, diseases that we, that this is going to impact. I mean, I, 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 I think about food poison, right? I'm right. thinking about um, the flu. Um, I was talking to a buddy of mine out in, uh, in uh, Panama uh, just this week. And they're in lockdown as well. I mean, right. we hear that in the news, right? Because it's not that, you know, we, it's not in our wheelhouse right now to listen to other countries. But it's interesting, like the remainder of the world is doing, the, the rest of the world is doing the same thing. But that's going to impact also their health as well in a positive way, right? right. So, um, you know, I, 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 I usually think that the, the, the universal precautions that we typically use in the operating room are washing our hands, making sure that, um, that, that we are diminished the risk of actually contracting a disease. It's interesting. I was, li I was reading into the Wall Street Journal. Um, there was an article about this uh, German uh, physician who, in his, back in the day, he popularized or he had noticed that uh, pregnant females, postpartum uh, sepsis uh, was, a, it was about 20, 30% uh, happening in the hospital, right? Because people, to your point, didn't use gloves. They, so he instituted a very regimental, rigid um, process in which you had to wash your hands before and after handling a patient, okay? And this is, I think it was in the early, late 1900s, anyway. And, and his post-sepsis infection, uh, postpartum sepsis infection rate went from 20, 30% to 2%. And it was wow. hand washing. So I, you know, I, I think that all of this is going to impact other diseases as well. That's going to have a direct impact on maybe, you know, the finances of healthcare. There's going to be some, some, right. Right. Because of other things that we're doing with drug developments and R&D and all that stuff. But I think it's going to be a really good thing. I also wonder, and I wanted to pick your brain about that. What, what do you think is going to happen with these patients that now are not coming to the hospital because they're afraid? One, they're afraid of contracting, okay, um, the, a, a virus or any disease, right? And, and we're now you know, our census is incredibly low because people are staying at home and not going right. to the doctors. Um, that's one aspect, right? That's so, that social distancing and the social isolation and, and not going to a place where we know it's going to be COVID positive is affecting the census in the hospital, which is an, an economic effect also, right? right? Absolutely. But then, but then there's that piece, but then also with everything that's gone on, in the economy today, and we're reporting the one of the largest unemployment rates, okay, in years. Um, last week, we reported, I think, six and a half million people uh, filed for unemployment, okay, when we were actually at 0.2 million people, okay, in February. It'd been a year, it'd been a maiden year for, for jobs in the United States. 
the problem that I see with that, and you probably know where I'm going with this, is that unemployment equals uninsured. Yep. And so what happens in every study, and you can actually fill in the blanks now, what happens with in our every study that we put in the variable unemployment? Right. In short, what, what happens, Stuart? Right. And of course, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure this is a, a, a parallel concept or not, but I'll throw it out there. You know, if you look at the underserved, so you don't have to make it unemployed, you just make it uninsured, right? Yep. Which, um, so, you know, we've already, and I want to be very careful how I word this, we've already, we have done this experiment in perpetuity. Yep. And, and, you know, we have a lot of data. This is not my area of scholarly expertise, but it is for others. And we kind of know, right? We know anecdotally yep. what some of the impacts are, to your point of, yep. of access to care, of, of ability to go and get care, of being receptive, an enterprise being receptive to have them come for care. And we all know, everyone knows the impact of, well, you can't turn me away if I go to your emergency room, right? So that becomes your primary care home. Um, we've now just added over the last two weeks, 10 million people to that, to that paradigm, yep. right? And they're not used to that. They're, they weren't the underserved living in these, all of them. Um, these are individuals in small businesses who, who had a paycheck and, and lived in, in middle-class America. And again, not to get too philosophical about this, but you are right. We are about to do this experiment live time and we will be dissecting this. So one question will be, how long is this going to last? We know that once we get the COVID under control, the economy is not gonna be like a rubber band. It's not gonna just come back to its normal elasticity. And then there's gonna be this ongoing of what is the, what is the ultimate tale of this when it comes to healthcare. That's your world, that's my world. Um, what's gonna happen to third party payers in this, right? You can just see now all these discussions are on the front burner. They're not on the back burner all of a sudden. Well, and, and, and it gave me an idea. I was like, thinking that maybe for the next uh, show, I'm gonna talk to, uh, see if I can interview Mike Sanborn, uh, being the president of a prominent hospital in Fort Worth. Right operations are we doing for that? Because to your point, when things are not going to go back to normal tomorrow. Right. I can't, I, I can, you know, we're speculating right now, which is always a little dangerous in medicine, but, but we're common folks that, you know, participate in the community or part of society. It's going to be a little bit before this gets to normal. So then, so then when the economy and everything starts shifting and this gets under control, I mean, the folks that have closed shop, they have to still start up again, right? right. They're, they're, the individuals that have lost their job have to find a place to work at. We have tried to do as a society, and I've seen this done in, in, or read about it in big companies like Amazon and GE and others, that they basically don't fire people. They just reshift their positions and they put them, they keep them inside, right? Because they, I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. Right, right. But but there's all of this other faction that basically are jobless, um, and uh, and and they by definition, may, some of them will not have insurance, and then it, by the time they get back on getting a job and getting insurance, I mean our our culture has changed so much that people may not want to go to the doctor, you know, because why I, you know, um, tying into this whole telemedicine thing, I think the telemedicine medicine thing is a good thing, right? We can serve more people, but then, you know, it, it just minimizes the amount of interaction and, and the ability of bringing in people that need care. Well, and I even think Gonzo, um, and I don't know, we'll, we'll see this play out. Maybe you're very receptive to telemedicine with your patients and maybe I'm not. And now patients will have, that'll be a new binary decision for patients, right? So rather than getting in my car, having to park in somebody's parking lot, all of those inconveniences, right, and expenses, um, I can cue you up and we can have our 15 minute um, uh, uh, interview. You haven't been able to lay hands on me. No. I think, uh, and, and challenge me if you disagree with this. I, I think medicine is a, 
it does two things that are um, that are that appear to be very opposed to themselves. One is we're a huge yacht in a small slip, and it takes us forever to change. That's the first thing, right? So we keep doing things because we did them in 1980, and we did them in 1990, and we did them in 2000. That might be how I do my procedure. It might be what drugs I prescribe for hypertension. It doesn't matter, right? The second thing, however, is I think medicine is a little uh, Darwinian. I think when things start to just become very evident that things have changed, then, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I use that here because this may be that moment in time for medicine. We've talked about this. We set up a telemedicine yeah. program in the reservations in, in Arizona because otherwise we were not going to see those patients, right? But that was out of necessity. That wasn't out of efficiency and we thought it was a better way to deliver care. This is an inflection point, I think, to challenge, once again, how do we interact with our patients dist distantly, and then when do we have to interact with them in person? And we're being, we're, and that's where this is going to be Darwinian. I mean, you know as well as I do, one last example, you're the surgeon, I'm not, but laparoscopic surgery changed the game. And if I had trained pre-laparoscopic surgery, I better go and train how to do laparoscopic surgery. Otherwise, I'm not going to be the big ticket in my hometown at the end of the day. Well, and I, 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 there's nothing to challenge about what you just said. In fact, I totally agree with you because I, we have multiple examples of, of things that we've wanted to do for years and weren't able to, whether society uh, didn't want to accept it, whether the 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 specialties that I want to accept it whether we couldn't figure out legally how to do it okay because the telemedicine is probably the biggest example of something that was so contentious that people were so at odds not only the public but also the physicians and our and our professions that we didn't understand it and I think this is I think this is a disruptor but in a good way. Um, when I was a, a resident in uh, at Duke, I remember uh, going to listen to uh, or going to the uh, American Society of Thoracic Surgeons. It's the academics elite, uh, what's considered to be the elite uh, organization uh, in cardiothoracic surgery. And the president at that time was a was a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Cox. Jimmy Cox trained and practiced uh, trained at Duke and develops uh, in the lab when he was there, the cock maze uh, for procedure. Um, and so he was, he, was, he was basically doing that work in the lab, but it was Jimmy Cox who did it, and he became the president of the SDS. And I remember this very clearly because I, I truly was at awe, and I was like, boy, that's gonna be a really cool time. As a heart surgeon, his presidential address, address dealt with and touched on um, using telemedicine to provide care all over the wow. world. Wow. I was, uh, it, this is 2000. This is That's amazing. But this, uh, and I do remember this clearly because I was, I was saying, how is this going to work out right. for a heart surgeon? It's kind of counterintuitive to say, well, you know, I'm going to use telemedicine to take care of my patients. Come on. Well, I do. I mean, and right. honestly, Stuart, it's been, the best thing since I sliced bread because I no longer have to be getting in the car, driving. Yeah. Patients don't have to wait. I, I've done it now uh, in a dozen patients and they are like, this is the best thing. I don't have yeah. to leave my house. I can sit down, listen, you know, watch TV. You call me, I get myself on the cell phone. We see each other, we talk about things. It's the best thing. It doesn't interrupt. It doesn't consume your time. Now, I still don't know, and it'll be very interesting to to see how this, you know, evolves because there's legal ramifications about it too. Is how do you manage can with, with robotics, and we do do robotic surgery and microscopic mm -hmm. surgery, but with robots, as these devices become much more easier to manage remotely, will there be the day? And I would bet there's going to be the day that we can actually be sitting here, somebody walk in into a surgical hospital, okay? 
you do the surgery remotely maybe with the robot and we're already doing on site we've never been able to take the console and move it from within the operating room right. to another location there's going to be a time that we're going to figure out okay but there's a problem the risk of a problem is x and if we have to convert to open who's going to do that is, is it the guy sitting in the you right. know the console or is it a guy in there that's going to be able to do it i think that that's going to be the natural progression for surgeons um i know who's not going to do it gonzo the pathologist <laughs> you do not want the pathologist taking over at any point in time during that case well you'll you'll probably and you won't have to go to home we won't be sending the samples at home so that's the <laughs> that you have to I, I do think that there'll be a lot of reading going from home like radiologists right that you'll right, be right and and i'm sure that that's happening right now but i think that i think that honestly the telemedicine thing is is probably the best thing um Again, referring back to the NPR uh, store, uh, program that I was listening to this morning, where they were going with it is that they were more worried about how insurance companies were going to take advantage of that to lowball physicians in terms of their time taking care of patients. And to me, that um, it just changes the way that you do it. It doesn't change the amount of time. What I've found is that because now I can see a patient at any time, at any place, it's, it, there's, there's gonna be a better satisfaction maybe from the, some patients, I would hope from the majority, because now they don't have to wait. One of the, one of the variables that they check off is waiting times in the, well, right. if you don't have a place to wait and they can call you directly, what you've turned this is into the old, um, you know, when we used to do door. Uh, right, right. I think you hit a lot of things that five, 10 years from now, if this does gain roots like we think. So you've talked about patient satisfaction, right? And we're assuming it's going to be positive. You've talked about um, reimbursement. That's a, that, that, that's, there's got to be a reckoning to that. Um, HIPAA compliance. Right. When I've done telepathology, I have to make sure the person sending me the images never puts the slide label under the transmission because now you have an identifier. Right. Um, compliance issues, um, medical legal issues. So the things that exist already, but now it's a new medium. And the question to me will be, where will we be better because of these? And then where will we? you know, move a rock and there's something, you know, a snake under that rock. And, and we didn't anticipate that one, but again, give us five or 10 years. And I think we're going to be, um, I think it'll be interesting to look to see if this gained roots, you and I think it's going to, and then what are all the ripple effects in care, reimbursement, legal compliance, a patient satisfaction, um, and this will be an opportunity for us to optimize those rather than uh, uh, not lead, which I think is where we've gotten ourselves in trouble. We've allowed others to make decisions for us because we were busy being doctors and the others who made the decisions. And I'm not talking about higher reimbursement. I'm talking about things that optimize care. We've abdicated those to others. And now, we, now, now we're upset because we can't control our, our work environment. Um, this is a chance maybe to not be that passive and to be proactive in a new medium on which and in which we deliver care. Um, great. This has been a great visit, Stuart. Um, you know, I, I, as always, I always enjoy, you know, just talking to you about, uh, you know, everything and anything that has to do with our community, society, work, you know, medicine and stuff. You as always, you're awesome. Uh, you know, I wish we, we should have a show together, the Gons and Stewart, you know, fun show. <laughs> well, the one thing I don't like about the Tele show is you now get out of not having to buy me a coffee. No, I am actually. I, you know what? I'll do better than that. I'll send you a Starbucks card. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with that, how's that for? for That's why you're a surgeon and I'm a pathologist. You outsmarted me again, Gonzo. Good job. 
Okay, so Stuart, just before we wrap up, is there, um, I'd like you to take the opportunity also because I know there's students watching, uh, or, you know, hopefully there'll, there'll be other people watching, you know, in the community. Um, anything that you wanna close off with, you know, to, uh, to the medical schools, uh, TCU and UNT? Okay. I think, um, you know, just globally, we're in this one together. Um, and I think, the, I think uh, that's the beauty of Tarrant County. I won't speak to any place else. I think we've rallied. Um, and that's been a beautiful thing to see. Um, and so to our community, please um, understand that we're doing our best to give, you, to give you the best care. I think that's a very fair comment. To our medical community, from my point of view, thank you. This is one of the most trying times. I think this, this does very much echo what happened with HIV in the, in the, in, in the ripple effects through the community. And then physicians in training. This is your day to see what happens in kind of a worst case scenario. Um, kind of own this and, and, and learn from it and then help lead. Because you may be 50 years old and there's another pandemic. Learn from this. Have a memory. So we're better when you're 50 than we just exposed to you. Um, when you're young in this. So that, that would be kind of our, our global comment from me. Perfect. Well, Stuart, again, thank you so much for being part of the show. Uh, as always, insightful and uh, visionary. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next, you know, 50 years with you working, you know, in whatever. <laughs> We're not med students, Gonzo. Thank you very much. And, and to your audience, have a great rest of your day whenever you hear this. This is Dr. Dr. Gonzo signing off for Dr. Gonzo's talking points here in the Ask Dr. Gonzo Anything YouTube channel. Uh, guys, stay tuned. There'll be more programs coming up in the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Stuart. Take care. Thanks, Gonzo. Take care.